All right, so thank you everyone for joining for session uh, number five. Uh, this time we're going to be um, covering the doctrine of Satan. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a um, controversial one, but I think it's very important for us to cover it um, so we, know we, we understand who he is and what his role is. Um, yeah, there'll be of a bit of introduction of, um, yeah, kind of why we should cover this topic, what some of the views are on who Satan is. Um, then we will look at who Satan was before his fall, his, his fall itself, um, and then kind of who he is after his fall. We're also going to be looking at Satan's abilities, kind of like, okay, so we'll look at what he can do and things that he can't do, um, because there could sometimes be a bit of confusion on those things. Uh, I think also with like um, media and secular views can kind of make it very hard to understand um, what he actually is capable of. Uh, I'll, we'll look at a way that he tries to tempt us um, just so that we can be aware of this thing, um, his, his approach. Um, and then also we can, we'll, uh, I'll discuss a bit about like how we can react to um, his advances. So yeah, th there's typically two camps of people when it comes to Satan. The first few, it tends to be very focused on him um, and like an analyzing everything and thinking a lot of things that happen in the world are always, it's always Satan, you know, it's always the devil. Um, phrases like the devil made me do it comes to mind. Um, this can at times lead to like excessive amount of fear or paranoia. Uh, this is very alarming, particularly in kids that can like just grow a deep sense of fear for Satan and his powers because they aren't always able to differentiate um, yeah, these things. The other view is, well, the other problem with this view is that you can kind of shift the blame of things that you do in your life to Satan. Um, like the phrase, you know, the devil made me do it. Um, you kind of just, um, yeah, don't take responsibility for your own actions anymore. Um, and it becomes a form, uh, sort of scapegoat. The other view is that they kind of minimize the impact of Satan um, and they kind of just see him as like, I don't know, a side note. You can see this a lot in like cartoons. He's seen as this funny little red guy that, you know, this is a bit mischievous, you know, he wakes you up at night sometimes or he steals one of your socks. Um, I think that this has a, a negative impact as it can lead to people being naive and also have a lack of preparation. Um, to counter, um, yeah, the negative influence that Satan has on our lives. Um, yeah, and like I, I kind of say, uh, there's an expression like it takes two to tango, but there's it only takes one person to start a conflict, right? Um, the Bible tells us that Satan is our, or yeah, it says your, it's our adversary, adversary, and he's prowling around like a. Um, roaring lion seeking someone to devour now i've heard pastors say stuff like oh he's only a roaring liar but he, lion but he doesn't have any teeth this is not correct he does have teeth um and you know we can pretend that he doesn't exist or he's not you know we just pretend that he doesn't really matter for us that won't prevent him from still um trying to influence us or other people's lives um so yeah there's also um Biblically, there's a lot of information actually about Satan. Well, he's frequently mentioned, especially in um, like the Gospels where uh, Paul and other people are constantly warning us about Satan and his um, his plans for us. I mean, Revelations is all about the, um, yeah, there's, there's a huge battle and stuff like that with Satan involved. It's good to know who Satan is and what he can do when it comes to like just being aware of the spiritual warfare that's going on. I mean, the Bible says that there's a war that's being waged in the spiritual realms. So we need to be able to understand um, these things to also better help us, uh, equip us against his influences. Um, and of course, one of his things that he does is tempt us and try to deceive us um, in the Bible, for example, uh, with, with um, Jesus in the, in the desert, Satan uses scripture. Um, to try to tempt Jesus. He doesn't just, you know, come super obvious. He's a very subtle person. So it's good to be aware of certain things that he does so that we can just be on guard and be alert. Um, it also helps with uh, our theology, understanding who Satan is. 
Um, I mean, there is Satan tautology, which is the doctrine of Satan, that, um, which is part of demonology, which is the study of demons, which we'll be covering next time. Um, so yeah, understanding who he is can help us um, also understand different type of views, including like eschatology, which is the study of end times um, and the study of sin. Um, yeah, so it's just a very important part of our um, Christian life, I think, to know who he is. Um, yeah, there's a couple of different views when it comes to Satan within Christianity. Um, the most common one would be the, the literal approach and understanding to him. Satan is a real being um, and he exists as a fallen angel that operates uh, in opposition to God and his people. Um, there's the view that Satan is kind of a symbol um, and represents the forces of evil and temptation that are present in our world. Um, this is a view that's more held by the liberal and progressive Christians. Although we see what a lot of times is with when this view comes into play, um, they also start watering down other things, right? So there's like Satan, but then, okay, he, he gets watered down to this symbol, then demons, um, hell, um, these type of things are kind of all maybe because they're a bit uncomfortable, um, they, they kind of try to gloss it over. Uh, there's also the um, view that he's uh, a, a metaphor kind of for the ego, for human tendency, like selfishness, um, our pride. There's a few that he's uh, a du dualistic force for Christians, that he is kind of a equal but opposite version of God. Uh, this is kind of like the whole yin-yang thing, you know, good needs evil, to be in balance. This is um, fundamentally not Christian view at all, as God doesn't need evil, um, and it, God doesn't need anyone to balance him out. And also Satan, as we'll hope, hopefully you'll, you'll discover, is not equal in any way to God. I mean, um, he wants to be. I mean, this is his goal, of course. He wants this. This is probably the view that he would want to um, have people believe um, but it's not correct. And then there's also the view that Satan is a fa uh, is a fallen angel who can still be redeemed. Um, that there is a, a chance that he will be redeemed um, and saved through God's grace. Uh, they'll see it as, I don't know, maybe like the ultimate story arc or something like that. And this view is more in line with like universal universalism, um, which is kind of like that everyone is going to be saved at some point that no one is going to go to hell but and and satan will then be included in this view um, however scripture clearly indicates what satan is going to do and where he will end up in the future so this view again um doesn't really hold true so um for this case i'll be holding to the, liber the literal one that he is a literal being um yeah and we'll look at him and discuss him in that sense so here again, the little picture kind of dictates, you know, he's this, this cute little guy um, that's, yeah, just funny, um, but this is in no way anywhere near to who he is. I don't even know where this, this image comes from. Um, when we read the Bible, there's two main parts where um, it discusses G uh, Satan in the, in the pre-fall. Um, this is when he was called Lucifer. You have Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. The way that you can remember this is Isaiah 14 times 2, Ezekiel 28. Um, so you can kind of remember these two these two places. Um, in Ezekiel, it, it's, it's talking about the king of Tyre. Um, however, there's um, parts that are being just, that are clearly not about a person. For example, it's mentioned. Um, uh, I'll just read the verse here or some of it. Um, son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adored you. It mentions all the stones. Um, your, setting, your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created and they were prepared. You are anointed as a guardian cherubim for i ordained you 
for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fairy stones. So here we see that um, this is clearly not about a human uh, a being, um, but it mentions that uh, Lucifer, before his fall, was an appointed cherub. These were the angels that were actually in the direct presence of God um, on the Ark of the Covenant. You see these angels covering their wings, covering um, the Ark, as in kind of covering the presence. Um, so yeah, he was he was right there with God on on the mounts of God. He was he was a created being, so he's not an eternal being like God. He has a beginning. Um, so in this sense, he's already nothing like God. Um, he was, I mean, he was full of wisdom, seal of perfection, perfect in beauty. Um, he was a very appealing um, as far as looks and wisdom goes. Um, but that was not enough for him. He wanted more, which we'll read in Isaiah. And then he was also in the Garden of Eden. This is kind of referring to before his fallen self. So he seemed to be able to walk there as well um, before his fall and before he was kicked out ultimately. Then Isaiah, Isaiah um, 14, uh, it kind of covers more his fall. Um, it says here that um, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn, you were cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mounts of assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zufon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Um, but you were brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. So here you see that he wanted to be equal or exalt himself above God. Um, so uh, in this sense, the pri his pride um, and jealousy took over him. This was kind of in the sense the original, the first mention of sin that we have. Um, and then he was cast down. I mean, the, the 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 story will also kind of say how he's cast down to hell and he's he's made into a, a mockery, essentially. So you see here um, kind of the future also of where he will go. So it's it's kind of cool how prophecies work in, in the Bible. Um, they're a bit different than how we would normally talk. But here we see past, present and future all in one piece of what Satan's life is going to be like. Um when it comes to exactly the timeline of Satan's fall, we don't have any specifics, um, but we can deduce that he it happened um, after the creation of the world and before the fall of humanity. Um, some scholars would argue that tempting the tempting of Adam and Eve was actually um, his original or part of his original plan to overthrow God's sovereignty. Right, so he was going to attempt uh, tempt God's um, um, yeah, creation, so Adam and Eve, and then he would somehow prove that God is weaker or something like that. Um, but other people would suggest that this happened after his, um, after his fall as like a, yeah, maybe like a spite thing or something like that. Um, yeah. Then after his fall, so he was cast from heaven. This isn't referring, like he still has access though. It's not that he um, has lost his access. We'll see, it, I think three times in scripture, it says that Satan has been cast out of heaven. Um, but after the fall, I mean, we still see he's a, he's a personal being. He has his own mind, emotions, and will. His will was set against God. Um, and he has no other desire than just to ruin God's plans. Um, in Job, for example, we read that he, um, yeah, he's looking for people to tempt. Um, in Matthew um, 4, we see him um, trying to reason with God. So it shows that he has his own, he's not just like a robot that's being told what to do by God or something like that. Like he's, he's working on his own, um, his own plan, his own ambition. Um, as I said before, he, um, he still, well, he still has access to heaven. We read this in Job 1, um, where Satan is has to go before God to kind of present what he's going to be doing. Um, in Luke 22, um, it says that 
um, Satan actually approached God wanting to sift the apostles. Um, however, in, well, in the first case in Job, God lets him tempt, oh, but only to a certain point, right? He says, you may tempt, but you may not harm. Uh, later on, God allows him to harm him, but not kill Job. Uh, and then in, in Luke, um, yeah, his request is denied. So it shows that there's like a, a, he has to ask permission. The same goes for his demons. He can't, they can't just do whatever they want. There is this clear sovereignty of God that's always present. Um, Satan can't go outside of God's sovereignty um, and do things. Um, as opposed to maybe some views that, that there are out there where we kind of think that he's somehow equal and God's having to fight on equal terms, but yeah. So God's or Satan's primary goal is to nullify the effect of the word of God in people's hearts. Again, um, his, he's always targeting the relationship between God and man. This started in the in the garden where he, um, yeah, he attacks, he, he breaks the relationship between God and his creation. Um, and we see in Matthew that Satan is kind of stealing. So there's the parable of someone planting, uh, throwing seeds. Um, and Satan is then like snatching away the seeds of God's word in people's heart so that they can't root uh, and grow. And he also is um, in, in second Corinthians is credited with blinding the minds of unbelievers. So try, trying to everything he can to prevent people from, um, yeah, hearing the gospel and, and finding salvation uh, in God. Um, yeah, so the fourth point is very important is that Satan, I mean, has none of the attributes of God. I mean, obviously, he has no love, grace, mercy, and such things. Um, however, he's also not like omnipresent. So he's not in all places. He's not all knowing. Um, he's a created be being. So he has the same limitations as other beings. Um, we, we do know that Satan, for example, has control over. Uh, a network of demons, pro most likely all of them. However, it never specifically says that, but he has control over the, the demons that work for him and he gets acc accredited for those things. Uh, an example is, for example, nowadays with leaders of, of a country, right? When, for example, it says um, um, Biden has reduced the unemployment rate by so much, he hasn't actually done that. It's rather his governing body that he works with does these things um the same goes for satan he doesn't do all the things that um that the bible says but rather his um his kingdom or his people uh do these things so it sometimes seems like oh satan is everywhere all at once however he, he isn't able to do those things uh, and i think we'll also cover that um in a in a bit let me quickly just look yeah. So yeah, we'll look at the abilities of who say, of what Satan can and can't do. Uh, here, I'm, so this is a show. This picture is from a show called Lucifer. Um, I mean, it's already incorrect in the fact that Lucifer. I mean, God, like we see in the Bible at times, God giving people new names, like Saul becomes Paul. Um, Jacob becomes Israel, like in a positive sense. In this case, Lucifer goes from being called Lucifer to Satan, um, another, uh, which is the deceiver. He gets called the advocate. He even calls the, be, gets called the king of poop or something like that. So God kind of reduces his name. He, he releases that, that title, that name that God had originally given him. So this show kind of portrays Lucifer as a very nice character, or like I haven't seen the show enough to say everything but from what i've seen from the trailer is that he um comes across as a very wise charismatic intelligent person uh, and this is who satan wants to be seen as right he wants to be seen like god he will never display himself in a way that we won't like we like that people won't see him as god um he disguises himself as an angel of light he wants to be seen as glorious beautiful um, so this is this is kind of in that sense a better portrayal of who Lucifer is um, as to the little green devil or even there's the ones with like the, the the goat's head with horns and stuff like that these are inaccurate um, so yeah some things that he can do 
um, he fights in the spiritual realms. Um, in Daniel, there's um, Gabriel was meant to uh, give a letter or send a message to Daniel. However, he was being held back um, and wasn't able to proceed until the archangel uh, Michael joined the fights and allowed him to go further. So yeah, you see there's the spiritual fight going on um, that we aren't physically aware of, um, but that is nevertheless continue, continuously happening all around us. Um, he, Satan's able to cause physical harm uh, we read this in the book of in the book of Job. We see this, and also, um, for example, with the de demonic um, man that's living in the cages, um, the, the person harms himself. There's also the case with the boy, um, the the demon possessed boy that starts convulsing on the fire uh, on the ground and tries to throw himself in the fire. Um, yeah, well, that also leads to the third point. He's able to possess people. Him and his demons can do these things. Uh, we, we see that um, also with, for example, with Judas, uh, uh, it says that Satan came on to possess him and cause him to do things. Um, again, with like physical harm and possession, we have to be careful not to just clump everything into one box, right? So all physical harm or all physical sickness or something like that is always the devil. That's not correct. Um, there are instances where he does those things, but he's, I mean, he can't always do those things. If that was the case, I'm sure he would try to make everyone sick all the time, but God still has that control. Um, so when it comes to physical illness um, or mental illness and stuff like that, we have to be very um, careful and use the discernment of the Holy Spirit to be able to interpret what case this actually is. Um, Satan's able to tempt us. Um, he does this to Adam and Eve. He tries to tempt uh, Jesus. Um, he tempts a lot of people throughout the Bible, tempts David's, David's due to cons uh, uh, census of the people of Israel, even though God had told him not to. Um, but yeah, again, not every time we are tempted, it's because um, Satan is doing those things. So we still have to remember to keep accountability. Also, us as believers can't be possessed. Um, but yeah, that's the next point as well. Um, Satan is able to influence the world leaders. Um, he, Satan is able to work through governing bodies um, um, to attack um, Christians and to, um, yeah, execute his plans. We see this after Jesus is born with Herod. Um, he he's then he decides to kill all the children, um, well, young babies. Um, in an attempt to kill the Messiah that was just born. And we also read this in Revelations, where um, Satan is using the governing bodies of the world to try to bring about his um, kingdom. But this doesn't always mean that everything that happens um, bad um, with governing bodies, it's necessarily always the devil. Again, it's a, it's a case by case that we have to look at these things. Uh, however, not everything that governments do is, um, we should be like, oh, this is God doing this, right? Like, we have to be very careful to discern when is God doing something, when is the devil doing something, um, or when is neither um, doing something. Of course, I do want to emphasize God is always in control. God, it's never that something's happening outside of God's sovereignty. Um, but yeah, we, we need to be aware that. Um, it's not always God doing these things like God making nations like we read in Africa or, or what's happening in some parts of South America, um, that these people are just going completely against God. This is most likely the devil influencing um, certain people. The devil's also able to um, create false theologies and religions. Um, in 1 Timothy 4.1, for example, we read that some people have abandoned the faith and followed um, and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. So um, if it was just, if faith was just being a Christian or not being a Christian, it will be very black and white, right? It will be very easy to kind of convince people, for example, to, like that are seeking, here's Christianity, there you go. However, what Satan has done is he's absolutely saturated the market, so to say, with fake religions with false doctrines um, we can see this for example in catholicism where um, people have added 
to the gospel or have added to scripture, um, but also completely new religions. Um, there are hundreds of different religions that um, teach false things. Uh, and Satan does this in, a, in an attempt to confuse um, and deceive people from actually finding the truth. Satan is also able to perform signs and wonders. Um, we see this, for example, with um, Pharaoh's magicians. Um, they were able to perform some miracles that were um, lesser version of what Mo Moses and um, Aaron were able to do. Um, but in Matthew uh, 24, 24, Jesus warns that false, the, the false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive people and even, if possible, deceive the elect. So Satan does these things to try to draw people's attention away from God and to his religions. Again, Satan's always trying to pretend to be God, right? He wants to do everything that God does in his own way, however, always in a lesser, um, inferior sense. Satan is also able to use the opportunities we give him. So um, we read, for example, in Isaiah, uh, Ephesians uh, 4, 26, 7, um, that we shouldn't let um, our anger um, cause us to sin or let the sun go down, um, lest it gives Satan a foothold. Um, so these are things in our life that we... Um, yeah, let fester and grow like certain things. And then Satan's able to use those things to either turn us against our brothers uh, and sisters in Christ um, or even become bitter and angry towards people. Um, so this is why it's very important for us to always be um, in fellowship with God um, and always examining our own hearts to root out these type of things because Satan will use these opportunities. So here I have a, a little picture I found on Pinterest about some of the religions in the world. Um, so as you can see in the top, there's Christianity, but then all around it, there are many different religions, different um, yeah, subcategories of these religions. Um, so it can be very confusing to find um, the only true one inside of this pile. Okay, so those were some of the things he does do. There are also some things he doesn't do. Um, some of these are very um, obvious, but I think some of them also some a bit um, um, surprising. So one of the more surprising ones is he doesn't actually rule in hell. Hell isn't his kingdom or his domain. Um, he, he's actually a prince. He's called the prince of this age. So his kingdom is actually earth. Uh, we see this uh, when he's trying to tempt Jesus. He offers earth or the kingdom of the earth uh, to Jesus um, for the small price of worshiping him. Jesus, of course, knows that this is not the right thing to do um, and comes uh, counters Satan's use of scripture again with his own uh, or with more scripture. Um, but Satan is actually able to give this. Um, but Jesus knows that he will ultimately conquer Satan and claim this through the rightful way. Um, but and and hell is actually created for Satan and his followers um, as eternal punishments for him that will come in revelations. So lots of depictions where Satan is sitting on this throne in this fiery hell um, is is fake. It's um, secular pagan um, teaching somehow um, to kind of again make it seem like you can make deals with the devil and the devil somehow I don't know be your friend. Um, Satan can't separate us from God. Uh, we read this in Romans. Um, yeah, so this is also comes to um, salvation, you know, like if God has chosen us, he will pursue us and Satan can't prevent God from doing uh, and redeeming us, which also includes he can't take us out of the hands of, of Jesus. So we can't lose our salvation. Uh, we can't, the, Satan can't snatch us back into his ways, for example, um, after we have already been saved and sealed with the Holy Spirit. And this brings should bring great comfort to us. He is also not able to resist Jesus. Um, Satan, when it comes to powers, has no power against God. He can't do anything. Um, we see this, for example, when Peter is talking to Jesus um, and Jesus rebukes him. Satan leaves um, after Satan has been tempting Jesus three times. 
Satan tells him to leave and he leaves as well. Um, it's actually interesting with uh, in Revelation, which we'll cover way down the road. Um, it's actually not even Jesus that banishes Satan to prison for a thousand years. Uh, it's actually one of the angels that does this. Um, Michael, the archangel, the archangel, archangel. Um, so it even shows like, you know, God has, Jesus isn't yet even involved in this. Um, his de the demons are also not able to resist Jesus when um, the demons see Jesus on earth. They all fall down at his feet and glorify Jesus. There's, um, yeah, they're not able to withstand any of his commands. Um, he is not able to possess believers. Um, so people that are sealed with the Holy Spirits are safe from the, these type of possessions um, from Satan. Uh, it, is it is possible that Satan will still like try to tempt us, um, but he's not able to take control of our bodies. Um, as the Bible tells us that um, we can only have one, um, yeah, a house can only have one uh, occupant in, in a way, so Satan can't come into us. Um, something that I recently, or one of the things that I learned was Satan can't read our minds. Um, I don't know why I believe it, but I think, I guess it came from the thought of he's, you know, somehow all-knowing. Um, however, Satan is not able to do these things. Um, he's He isn't omnipresent. He isn't omniscient. Um, but uh, so he also like doesn't know what the future hold, like he doesn't know the future right he, I mean he can read the Bible um, and and see what the, what's going to happen to him but he probably doesn't want to believe that that's true um, but he doesn't know the future he doesn't know what our lives are going to be like he doesn't know what we're thinking uh, this is something that only God knows only God knows our thoughts and our heart um, However, Satan does have thousands of years of experience of tempting people, finding their weaknesses, and these type of things. So um, he and his demons are able to observe us from the outside um, and make educated guesses on how to attack um, our weaknesses and tempt us. But he's not able to know exactly what we're thinking at all times. Um, he isn't able to attack continually. We read. Um, in James 4, 17, or, uh, 4, 7, it says, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Uh, and this is applied that his, his attacks don't last forever, um, that if we resist him, um, he will give up and move on somewhere else. So if you ever feel like you're tempted in the moments, remember that we can always draw close to God um, and find deliverance from Satan and that Satan will then, again, flee. Finally, and one of the most comforting things is Satan can't win. Um, Satan has actually already lost. In Colossians 2.15, we read that having disarmed the powers and authorities, he, um, Jesus, has made a public, public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So we see that um, Jesus' victory over death and sin means that he's actually already defeated Satan and his demonic forces. So they are in a way working on borrowed time. They know that their demise is coming. So this is why they are not passively waiting for um, the, their end to come, but this is why they are actively pursuing to, um, yeah, ruin the fellowship with people, or between God and, and his people. So, um, yeah, if we look at some ways of how Satan tempts us, um, it, in the Bible, there are two very, um, there, there's the, the temptation in the garden, and then there's the temptation um, of Jesus in the desert, which are very similar in the approach that Satan has. He, um, he, I mean, he's been using the same tactic, as you see, for thousands of years. I mean, it generally doesn't it generally works, so you know why fix what uh, what's not broken. Um, however, he tends to try to um, promise us things to fulfill our desires. Right? Um, these temp these off promises are of course uh, empty, and he doesn't actually want to um, keep them. Um, but he desires things that we want to have, um, and he kind of uses it as a, a trade, a bargaining chip, and tempts us in exchange for our relationship with God. Right. So when we sin, we break fellowship with, with God. Um, this what this is what Satan ultimately wants from it. 
Um, but we in James one, First uh, James two sixteen, which was also today in church was read, was that um, and for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So this is kind of the three categories that you can kind of sum up Satan's um, temptations in. So we have the pride of life, which refers to the powers, um, prestige, and importance. Um, in the, the Garden of Eden, Satan appealed to Eve's pride by telling her that eating from the forbidden fruit would make her like God, knowing good and evil. Um, with Jesus, Satan offered him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, again, trying to appeal to his pride and desire for power uh, the lust of the flesh um, refers to physical pleasure and satisfaction uh, in the garden of eden satan appealed to eve's um, fleshly desire for food telling her that the fruit um, of the forbidden tree looked good um, for eating with jesus he of course turned the stone into bread to kind of appeal to jesus's hunger and then finally, there's the lust of the eye, which um, yeah, refers to the desire for material possession and things that um, are pleasing to the eye. In the garden, uh, Satan did that uh, appeal to Eve's desire for knowledge and wisdom, um, which is a very human thing to desire. But this is what he attacked in this case, uh, telling her that the fruit would give her, um, uh, the fruit was pleasing to her eyes. Uh, and again, give um, wisdom. And to Jesus, uh, Satan took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, uh, a pool, a, trying to appeal to his desire for material possession um, in the form of the world. Um, yeah, so but we see with when it comes to these temptations in the garden, Satan succeeded. But in, uh, in the case of Jesus, the temptation was ultimately overcome. Um, by Jesus relying on God's word and resisting the devil, um, which kind of leads us to the um, last bit where, um, yeah, how can we react to this? So the Bible tells us when it comes to Satan that we should um, stand firm. Uh, it, it normally uses, in these cases, defensive language, to stand firm, put on the armor and defend, um, resist, flee um, the devil. Um, it never tells us to directly engage him or seek him. So also with this thing, like we should have comfort in knowing that, um, yeah, Satan, while powerful, does not have control over us, but this shouldn't be an encouragement to somehow go and, um, you know, find the devil and, and confront him head on. Like this is not um, our responsibility either. Um, we aren't the ones to defeat satan but that's rather what god's role is um, our role is to remain faithful to god resisting his attacks trusting in god's power and sovereignty following christ and relying on the on the holy spirit um helping our fellow believers of course this is also important um which is why we read that we are meant to confess our sins this is what james 5 says we should confess our sins to one another and also pray for one another um so that we may find healing healing here in this case is referring to for example spiritual hurts um so this is why confessing our sin is so important right we repent from our things as opposed our, our sins as opposed to indulging in them giving satan again opportunity to attack us um and forgiveness is very important as well in second corinthians we read um that there was a there was a man that um was originally cast out from the church because of his sins however he repents and uh, um, Paul tells them that the believers there should forgive him and accept them back into the community as um, so, so that he does not overcome from his sorrow um, of the sin that he had caused, uh, um, had caused. So also for our own lives, um, there are going to be times where we give into temptation and we are going to sin, um, but we need to repent um, and seek forgiveness of the sins. Uh, and once we are forgiven, which we God promises he'll do, um, we are also meant to move on from that sin as opposed to somehow letting it continually ruin our, our relationship with God. Um, another verse that's actually very interesting is 2 Timothy 2.22. Um, 
in this verse, we read that um, we are to flee lustful passions, um, but then in return, we are meant to um, seek, uh, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. So um, while one part of it is running away from temptation, running away from sin, running away from um, being pulled into stuff, uh, we are meant to be running towards things of God instead so that we are not left as like an empty house in that sense, right? Where it's like, okay, well, I've got rid of all this bad stuff, but then I'm just going to sit here and wait. And then, well, that's naturally going to draw more bad stuff towards us because the spiritual relationship, I mean, it's a war. You're either going to be winning or losing. There's no like, oh, it's just neutral for the time being. And if I just don't move, nothing will happen. It's like, no, we have to, we're either moving towards God or we're moving away from God. Um, so we, if we are continuously seeking God in fellowship with God, in fellowship with other believers, um, studying his word, going to Bible studies, um, um, yeah, and, and being in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, then we won't have a desire to do these bad things. Um, we'll be too focused on others. And uh, analogy I like using is with when it comes to temptation is like you can't tempt someone that's full with meat like a nice juicy piece of meat right it's not going to be tempting to them if they have already eaten it's only tempting when someone's really hungry um, and Satan will see that desire for food and then he will then use something to kind of be like hey you're hungry I have some food here um, uh, an example of this we read in Genesis when Esau trades his birthright for a bowl of stew, right? So he is hungry and wants food. And then Jacob is able to deceive him and be like, hey, how will you give me your birthright? And and Esau's just like, kind of like, well, sure, I'm hungry. I want the food. You can have this birthright. What's the point of it? However, he had if he had remained, if he had brought food with him and wasn't hungry, he would not have been tempted in this way to um, yeah, give away his birthright. Uh, and the same can be done for our lives. Um, yes. So I, I, I just with this presentation, I just kind of wanted to show um, that, um, yeah, just to summarize, you know, Satan is a real being um, that is opposed to God. He's not in anywhere near the quality of God, right? Like, so he's not this omniscient being that's, that's the yin to the yang or the yang to the yang of God. Um, and we need, but we need to be aware of his, um, his, his role, right? He, and Satan, of course, isn't the only, only temptation or struggle that we have faced in this world. Um, sa while Satan has his own army um, to use to, to disrupt us, there are also, other things like there's like the world's desires, the natural desires that humans have that can lead to um, sin. Um, so, but he can also use those things and Satan will do whatever he can use any opportunity he can to tempt us um, and take us out of fellowship with God. Um, and not just us believers, but also unbelievers. Um, he uses things. Um, I found that um, I grew up in Papua New Guinea um, and in that country, I feel like people are a lot more uh, uh, sensitive or in tune to the spiritual world. Um, while in the Western cultures, we're a lot less um, aware of it. You know, we we, we kind of I, I we kind of think it's silly or it's like, oh well, you know, that's just, that's something that's in the Bible. In 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 the West, we have a lot of, with science with psychology. We're like, oh well, this is actually, you know this diagnosis or here's a label for this. This is actually what this person's going through. Uh, and we just need to give them some medicine. Um, but in, in places like in Africa or um, Latin countries um, and Papua New Guinea, um, Southeast Asian countries, um, people are a lot more aware of spirits. Um, they try to appease spirits a lot. And you see that these people, when it comes to p demon possessions and stuff like that and, and being yeah, controlled by these things. It's a lot more visible. However, in our Western world, we are controlled by things that are a little bit less visible. This can be, for example, pride, um, gluttony, for example. These are things that, that the West people are more 
um, susceptible to, you know, physical possessions, the consumerist calp like consumerist culture that we have in the West of having more than the neighbor um, are certain things that Satan can use to draw us further and further away from God um, and just distract us from actually being in a relationship with him. So these are just things that I, I, I hope to point out that this is what Satan is always trying to do. Um, we don't have to fear Satan. Satan has no hold over us. Um, but yeah, I, I just encourage you kind of like, yeah. Again, in prayer, we are able to resist the devil. Um, the Bible in the New Testament, if you read the letters, uh, the epistles, for example, um, there's a lot of instructions and in how to deal with these things and how to identify Satan's uh, advances um, because these, these, these tactics of his shouldn't be um, a mystery to us. The Bible is very clear on him and his attacks. Um, so yeah, uh, I just want to thank everyone for um, joining. Next week, we'll be talking about um, angels and demons. So we'll kind of go more into the, the, the military the, the infantry troops essentially of the spiritual war that's going on. Um, and we'll look at, for example, some of the, the structures within like the angels, the, the structure within the, um, the demons. We have, for example, the, uh, the unholy Trinity, um, which is Satan, um, the antichrist and uh, the false prophet. Um, we'll look at kind of the, the power dynamics and what these demons do. It's similar to what some the demons are very similar to what Satan does, of course, because he's empowered by them. Um, but we're also going to look at the angels and how they um, how they operate. So, yeah, thank you guys so much for your time. Um, I'll just stop the recording now.